the day before the shutdown. That's right. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. And we were just talking about how Mahogany Brown was our last in-person event before the pandemic shut us all down. And all these folks who wanted to come were like, no, we're good. We're going to sit in the house. <laughs> and so we are thrilled to be able to do this virtually and get to hang out with all of y'all wherever you are in the world. We hope you will shout out in the comments where you're watching from. But we also, of course, want to like do it right and have you back physically in the space. So we're going to make that happen as soon as we all get the shot and are safe. Um, we're going to we're gonna really throw a, a for real proper party for you. <laughs> oh, um, I can't wait. Y- yes. I, um, I got dose one, so I'm ready, almost ready. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're looking forward to all the people that we um, want to have redos with uh, once, once we open back up. So tonight we're joined um, by Tiffany D. Jackson. Tiffany is the critically acclaimed author of the YA novels um, that are, well, of many YA novels, including the Credit Scott King, John Steptoe, New Talent Award winning, Monday's Not Coming, the NAACP Image Award nominated, allegedly, let me hear a rhyme and her 2020 title, which we are still loving and celebrating, Grown. She received her, her Bachelor of Arts in Film from Howard University, her Master of Arts in Media Studies from the New School, and has over a decade in TV and film experience. This Brooklyn native is a lover of naps, cookie dough, and beaches, <laughs> currently residing in the borough she loves, most likely multitasking. So welcome, Tiffany. It's nice to have you back with us. Um, nice to be here. Yes, uh, and we're here tonight celebrating Mahogany L. Brown. Mahogany is a writer, organizer, and educator. She's also the executive director of Bowery Poetry Club and artistic director of Urban Word NYC and poetry coordinator at St. Francis College. Brown has received fellowships from Agnes Gund, Air Serenby, Cave Canon, Poets House, Mellon Research, and Rauschberg. Rauschenberg, sorry. She is the author of Woke, A Young Poet's Call to Justice, Woke Baby, and Black Girl Magic, Kissing Caskets, and Dear Twitter. She is also the founder of the Woke Baby Book Fair, a nationwide diversity literature campaign, and as an Arts for Justice grantee, is com- completing her first book of essays on mass incarceration, investigating its impact on women and children. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. Her newest book, which we are here celebrating tonight, is Chlorine Sky. So welcome to you both. Yes, <laughs> it's got a beautiful cover as it has us grown. Um, and I also just want to thank our co-host, Auburn Avenue Research Library. Morris Gardner is with us tonight. He's going to be adding resources to the chat. So I just want to let folks know these resources are going to stay up. So please stay with us in sort of the main conversation and know that you can go back at the end and click all of those links. They will stay up. They don't go anywhere. You can come back to this link anytime. You can rewatch this video as many times as you want. So do not feel any pressure. They will be here. The last thing I want to let you know is that you can click this ask a question button and put your question in the question box at any time during the event. And we'll get to the questions towards the bottom, uh, like last quarter of the event. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way and uh, mm-hmm. I'm let y'all take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hey, girl. Hey, hey boo. Oh, my hey. goodness. We are here. <laughs> Penny so, or no? Thank right. you. You're welcome. Thank I'm you glad. I'm, I'm so excited for you overall. Like, I mean, this book was so beautiful and, you know, definitely long time coming, I felt like. Um, but yes, so I'm excited. Usually, you know, we actually could have done like this event together. Like, yes, we're neighbors. We're literally neighbors. We <laughs> like it's a four minute walk to our house, guys. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, still pandemicking. Yes. And I got the second shot this past weekend. So I like, this is the most like alive I've been. Mm. <laughs> today has been. <laughs> Today, today's the day. This is the upswing after a it week. Is the upswing. I was like, oh, okay, yes, I'm all right. Mm-hmm. Now I know what to look forward to. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I don't know where to start. Like, I'm so like, I want to like ask you questions. I want to okay. read. I want to talk about everything. I guess like first for those who don't know what this book is about, how about you give us like a little like you know just brief. Elevator, Elevator pitch. pitch. Yeah. Okay. So Chlorine Sky is a novel in verse centering a young black girl growing up in California. Um, her name is Sky. She goes by Lil. Um, 
but actually you don't really know her her name until the end. So there's your there's the only spoiler I think I can give. <laughs> um, she's besties with this this uh, bright light named Laylee, and they have this friction, this tension that comes up that makes the protagonist Sky have to reconsider who she is, not just to uh, the world, but who she is to herself. So much of her understanding of who she is is based on her friendship. Um, so I just wanted to like write this uh, coming of age novel. Um, while it is in verse, it allowed me to tackle so many different themes, including uh, what does consent look like and fractured friendships and sibling rivalries and the impact of mass incarceration and single parent households. Um, and it goes on and on and on. The idea is that you you see this young person living and noticing, not necessarily having the answers, but still realizing that this is uh, this is happening and it's affecting her. Um, so how how does she take all of that in and still love herself enough to take up space when she walks in the room? Um, she loves swimming and she loves playing basketball. And those are the ways in which she starts understanding and articulating all of the many things that feel just insurmountable. Yes. You basically like hit all the questions I thought of, but <laughs> <laughs> I think what was so amazing about this story, I mean, first of all, there's not enough stories like this to be told like verse or not, um, in verse or not, um, that really like touches upon, you know, friendship friction and how that has a domino effect of how young girls start to you know, absorb the world and start to yeah. look at things so differently. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know, like, did you ever go through like a friendship breakup or a friction that you can like, mm -hmm. you know, allude to? Cause maybe you're still like cool with them, but you know. I went through several breakups, honestly. Like, <laughs> um, so the, the beginning of this book is actually a real life experience. That was a poem and that poem became the foundation of this story. Ah. The poem was written, geez, what is this, 2021? I'd say six years ago. Okay. Um, and I was able to like rock that poem every time I touched the stage. And no matter the demographic of the, the room, there was always someone who was like, oh, that damn Laylee, like, oh, <laughs> man. And they were like, it, either they had been hurt by a Laylee mm -hmm. or they realized that they were a Laylee. And that's mm -hmm. really like, you know what I mean? That That's like the pivot in this book that all of us have made mistakes, right? All of us have been inconsiderate to someone that we thought we would never, you know, uh, abuse before. And and you know we all we all make mistakes. So how do you come to terms with hurting your loved ones? Do you have a chance to? Um, I, I wanted to like really tussle with that that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yes, <laughs> absolutely had a had a breakup. Girl I had a breakup years ago. Like just you know what I mean? It's like, wild. Well, no. <laughs> friendships are hard. Friendships are hard. No one tells you that mm -hmm. friendships are just like romantic relationships, right? You, yeah. You're just as vulnerable, if not more. Yeah. So um, for my second book, Monday's Not Coming, that was somewhat of a friendship breakup story because it involved missing Black children. Mm -hmm. And you really sort of dived into the ideas of friendship. So whenever I do, you know, go ahead and have talks and, you know, especially in schools, I always say like, you know, your best friend, like that first friend that's like, you know, gets the meat of you is truly like the real first love of your life. Yes. Like they know where the bodies are buried. They know you inside out. Like no one is going to know you like your best friend. So yeah. when you break up with your best friend, oh. or if you have friction with your best friend, it hits so much harder than mm -hmm. it does with like, you know, your partner, because your significant other, it's just sort of like, you know, I don't know, you almost like expect them to do something dumb, but not exactly. your person, not your yeah. like, not your like left hand or right hand. No. But, you know, you don't expect that. So I feel mm -hmm. like that's what I felt Sky sort of like going through in the very beginnings where mm -hmm. she's just like, oh, wait a second. Like it was like such a wake up call and it was such mm -hmm. a painful wake up call. And so I loved how you, you blended it in so flawlessly because I felt it. Like I remember reading this a while ago and, and being like, mm, like, like kind of like someone like flicked my, like, you know, your forehead. <laughs> oh, that one hurts. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> But oh, 
know that like it, it, it didn't draw blood, but you definitely sunned like, me just now. <laughs> yeah, like that was my whole third eye. You just like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't but, want to be so like heavy handed with the, you know, yeah. do unto others. Like nobody cares about that. Look, everybody yeah. makes mistakes, fam. Like how do we atone? Sometimes we don't. Ooh, yes. There was a recently, I think there was a um, interview with Sister Soldier. I think she was on like, you know, the Breakfast Club or something like that and said something along the lines of like, you know, counsel me, don't cancel me. And I, you know, I've been sort of meditating on that phrase of, you know, the ideas of cancel culture, even just being within our, you know, friendship dynamics. Like, you know, the idea like canceling someone is someone like, breaking up with someone or having that friction like oh i don't talk to her anymore yeah. and you literally sort of like erase everything you leave out communication and this was like your person so i thought mm -hmm. that was um the way this sort of happened the way like you know sky was like watching it mm -hmm. and just you know at some point she did sort of be like you know we'll forget her too and that's just uh, that hurt <laughs> have you been there before oh yeah yeah, have you definitely. been sky or Laylee of your knowledge? I was definitely the sky. I was mm -hmm. not the Laylee. Um, mm -hmm. to my to my knowledge, honestly. Um, because any Laylees happen like, you know, later in life. Like, you know, mm -hmm. after 35, you know, there's plenty of like, you know, oh no, nah, we 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 ain't cool anymore because we're adults and you acting like a child. Like, you know, like it, you have those type of scenarios. But as a kid, absolutely. I mm -hmm. definitely was this guy who was abandoned by friends, um, mm -hmm. very cold and heartless manner. Um, I will say that it made me turn into my art very early. Mm -hmm. um, it made me sort of self-soothe with like, well, forget them. I'll just, you know, write this book. I'm like, mm -hmm. nice books. Like, you know, like <laughs> I saw, I self soothed that way, which mm -hmm. I felt like that was kind of what Sky was somewhat yeah. doing. She was leaning towards her, you know, leaning towards swimming, which I love to swim, and leaning towards basketball, which I still don't understand. So, <laughs> close enough, close enough. Yeah, she was trying to figure it out and not be like, someone who was just chasing after mm. this this person. Um, but I also wanted to show that more times than not, whether we realize that we have the capacity of being both Laylee and Sky, mm. more, more times than not, we're trying to like replace or recreate this um, closure or, or, or a formula, like an answer to the formula. Yeah. because her relationship with her older sibling is also very reflective of Laylee's behavior. Yeah. And some folks picked up on it and I was like, good, I'm glad somebody caught it because this whole thing is like, I think it happens often where we are attracted to relationships in the world, right? Mm. And you'll be like, oh, that's just like this one person I remember in seventh grade, or this is just like my brother all of those things, like you're attracted to that energy because mm. something in you wants to fix what couldn't be fixed in, in those old uh, or previous relationships. And relationships really have no true control of it because you can't fully, like at that age, you really can't like, you know, break up with your sister. Nope. Like you still have to deal with them on an everyday basis. And that's something that you feel like you, you truly can't fix. So you sort of lean into like, how else can I fix it in another way? Um, which I thought was actually, I didn't really peep that until like much later in the book where I, I think like Laylee and, and, and the sister was sort of like, you know, like they were like both going at Sky, mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh yeah. Ugh. Like, oh, they teamed up. Mm. Yeah. Like they're from the same cloth and it's just yeah. like gross. <laughs> gross. 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 Yes. Well, we had some time to like read um, because even though you were like, I'm all about celebrating you, Mahogany, which I love and I appreciate and I thank you. Y'all need to know, um, Tiffany walked um, grown the galley to the crib. <laughs> what she didn't know is that I had caught COVID, so I wasn't coming outside, right? Remember, I was right, like, I remember, yes. 
<laughs> but I was on the upswing at that point. So it was like in my second week of recovery. Mm. And I was just like, I can't do anything but sleep and read, which was lucky for me because I couldn't even open my eyes for the first 10 days. So I was at the point where now I can open my eyes and my the fog had lifted and I just need something. And you brought me that book. When I tell you I broke the fever and the night with that book. <laughs> so I wanted to share a part that I really liked. Um, okay. And 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 if that's okay, maybe we can do like yeah. a favorite of Corrine, but I want to go first with yours because- Okay, okay, you got it. <laughs> and of course you bring in, you know, the whole Frank Ocean moment, which is to say you're brilliant. Uh, it's chapter two. And I'm going to skip around a little bit because okay. it's so lush that I just want, I just want yeah. you to see the landscape, just lay in it. Okay. okay. Swim good. Then in my past life, I was a mermaid. I lived deep in the ocean, swimming free, eating crustaceans and singing five octave ballads. My notes caused ripples in the sea. Whales, turtles and seahorses alike gathered for my daily concerts. But on land, I struggle to breathe. Humans don't understand my pescatarian diet and singing is a concept, not an aspiration. Sitting a few feet away from a near Olympic size racing pool, I warm up my quads. Pool water is nothing but fake water. Swimming in it feels unnatural, but it's the closest substitute I can manage to find. Whitney Houston hums through my headphones, where do broken hearts go, which is also my jam, okay? <laughs> the stretching playlist has some of my favorite classics, Mariah Carey, Aretha Franklin, Diana Ross, Shaka Khan, Nina Simone. Wish I could hook it up to a waterproof speaker and drop it into the pool. Synchronized swimmers listen to music underwater all the time. Maybe I should try out next year, be a tour de force, an underwater ballerina who can sing. Arms extended up with a graceful bow. I stretch and hum and stretch and hum. The thing about singing near the pool is the acoustics. My voice carries notes bouncing off the tiles, the dome roof, then skipping across the water like a pebble before boomeranging back. Every word pulses and echoes through my bloodstream, but then the song ends. The adrenaline leaves me breathless. Applause shakes me out of a trance and I glimpse down at my fans, a group of eight pale faces in matching Navy swimsuits. Wow, it's like, you can really sing, Hannah says in disbelief. You sound just like Beyonce. The other teammates nod in agreement. My heart deflates a bit. I love Beyonce, but they use that comparison because that's the only black singer they know. Ladies, a voice shouts behind us. Coach Wilson leans against the doorframe of her office, pushing her red glasses back up her thin nose. If you're done with your concert, can you kindly get your butts in the water? Now, 10 laps, let's go. The whistle blows and I dive in, slipping under the surface like sliding into a freshly made bed. After warm up, coach talks us through a few practice drills. I hit the wall at the end of the pool on my last lap and power back. On land, Coach Wilson clicks her stopwatch, her face unreadable. Okay, I'm gonna just stop there because if y'all haven't read this, you've got to get your lives together. But what I love is not only is she created a mythology of herself, but she's also like challenging um, um, the flattening of black women voices. She's like, mm -hmm. You just want to call me Beyonce because that's the only one you know. I love, I love those moments of like, here's a myth that you never heard. Here's this baby singing swimming pool, like we synchronize, right? And then, <laughs> and then here's like this really amazing critical understanding of race theory. Hmm. Like what? So Get grown. Yes, study. Can you just read like the rest of my book? I like that. That sounded really good. I was just sitting there like. Wow, that like who wrote that? Wow, who wrote that? <laughs> I read every book always. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Have you? Yeah. Wait, did you read this book? Did I did. you do the book? Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. I, got it. I, got it. <laughs> I love when authors, specifically poets, read <laughs> their own work because there's a cadence that no one like you know 
as much as we love our narrators, like, you know, you don't always get like the way, like the words are supposed to swing off your tongue. And so I feel like that's like, yeah. So I always like kind of download the book and read it along with like, yes, I love that kind of like pairing reading, but thank you. That is, um, yeah, that's the beginning of a story. So I love the fact that we both had like pools in our, in our book. <laughs> that's Why, right? was, like, you know, a big, especially when like, you know, when we were younger or at least for me, as much as I love swimming, it also brought a lot of anxiety based on just like my hair. Same. It was like, I ain't got good hair. And we, you'll hear that in the in this poem, in the book, the idea that we're our, our kids believe there's good and bad hair. Very young. You're mm -hmm. like, I don't I don't have good hair. So I'm going to get in there and they're just going to make fun of me and I'm going to look crazy. So I'm going to stay in the pool the whole time. <laughs> I'm going to be underwater the whole time. And so you're you know, it's a ponytail. Yes. So then you won't really see the shrinkage. It's a mess. I, it's actually, a mess. I actually had a talk with a young lady who you know, said something along the lines, like, I don't have good hair. And then I was kind of saying, like, there's no such thing as good hair. You know, I'm just, you know, kind of giving my spiel. And the young lady who, you know, I love when kids challenge me yes. because it makes me sort of like check my own, like, you know, check my own like verbiage. She right. said, it's not about having good hair. It's about your hair being easier than mine mm -hmm. to manage. Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, she said in those type of words, like, it's not even good, it's just easier. Like, you don't have to worry about it the way I have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as much as I as I hate that, I also want to affirm her feelings because I also know what it's like to worry about your hair. Even at this, you know, my old age, like I'm still sitting here like, you know, well, what is my hair going to look like next week? Like I have to like comb it out. So like I still have that anxiety. And so mm -hmm. I think it's always, you know, that's what I loved about it kind of being mentioned in the book. Like, you didn't shy away from it. Um, but you also saw the strategies that Sky took to sort of like, you know, keep keep it together, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. She was but, always just trying to manage it. Yes. Excellent. Manage. Yes. Yeah. A managing of like how you move into this world and how you are seen in this world. I think that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's real. Like, I think a lot of us, we pretend like we don't, but we all do. And I don't feel like it's, I feel I feel like it's important that we are truthful with kids, that we show them like, yeah, even, you know, I'm telling you not to like, you know, call your hair good hair and stuff like that. But I also understand having to deal with your hair because yeah. I'm tender headed and I, you know, Ooh. I hate homes. Ooh. Them. Same. <laughs> the same. Wait, so let me let me read to you um, two of my favorites. OK. So, you know, I'm going to butcher this because I don't, you know, I, I am the stage like Mo is, but <clears throat> first, let me read to you the dedication because when this book first dropped and I picked it up, that was actually like my, like, this was like my favorite part. Like I instantly was like, yep. <laughs> so <laughs> says uh, to my grandmothers, thank you for teaching me kindness to my younger self. You deserve, you deserve, you deserve. To my daughter, you are the most beautiful poem I've ever written. Yo, you just like shamed all of my dedications like from henceforth. Like I have never thought about like kind of like shout, like, you know, shouting your own self out, like, you know, self-worship in mm. a way. Like mm. saying you deserve this, like in a book that you wrote. So I was like, I'm, I'm totally, you know, just gonna copy this. <laughs> Take it. it off the page here. Yeah. Um, but that's when I knew like this book was about to be fire because I was mm. like, oh my god, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to read okay. uh Laylee, right? Am I saying Laylee. okay? Laylee laughs. Laylee laughs like the jokes on everybody but her. Laylee squints into the mirror and pouts. Laylee applies more lipstick. Then a little. Laylee takes my lipstick as backup just in case. Laylee says, It's so boring here. Let's call Sean. I laugh like the joke is on Sean. He's her old crush and first boyfriend since her mama left the house. But then I realize she just called my house boring. And now my feelings are hurt. Laylee says, Don't be like that. I ain't mean nothing by it. 
Laylee pulls my ponytail a little. Laylee is forgiven again. When I tell you, that was like, I heard my whole self in this. Like I heard my whole self in it. Like I, you know, would laugh. And so it's kind of like, you know, you know, making fun of you, like that mm -hmm. passive aggressive sort of, you know, undertones. And then you're laughing because you're like, oh, it's a joke. But you realize like most jokes have like that 15% truth or 10% truth or something like that. The saying goes. Mm -hmm. So that, like that right there was like a very painful like memory for me, which is, you know, what mm -hmm. I love also is that all of the we have all had these experiences in this book. Mm -hmm. Like this is very much growing up girlhood. A lot of teens can see themselves on the page. And I think that is crucial in this yeah. day and age when we're like, we're being gaslit on an everyday basis to say like, oh no, that didn't happen or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. So I feel like, <laughs> Thank you and, for that. And then, I remember people saying, "You're so sensitive. Why are you so sensitive?" And it's like, "Why aren't you? <laughs> aren't you sensitive?" Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I, and I found myself saying it to my daughter, and I was just like, "I have to not say that because I remember how depleting and mm -hmm. invalidating it felt." You know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Thank you for reading that the invalidation of feelings is where sort of our like, you know, neuroses kind of like, you know, that is sort of the spine of it is when we're kind of told that something didn't matter, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we grow up and we're like still questioning, you know, our own like things that we experience. Like, no, that yes. actually did hurt. That that hurt me. That hurt my feelings. Yeah. 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 That actually hurt me. No, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah. you, like, hold, hold up, hold on. Um, yeah, I know. But, yeah. And I remember, like, even when I, I said it, like, I never said it hurt me. I just kind of laughed it off because that desperation to still have, you know, that friend, because mm -hmm. I mean, even your only friend would like outweighed the risk of expressing yourself. Right. So right. I think that was. Truthfully, like, you know, a lot of the things that Sky didn't hear, like, I, I sort of wish that I was, like, as brave as her because I, I was a punk. I'm still a punk, but. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right. I think um, it's funny. I feel like some of my rage that I didn't have as a child, just like, you know, like, I hit 30 and it was like, oh, who wants it? Like, what's up? Yes. Yeah. You, you really, you really have no, you have none to give at a certain age. You keep, it's. The, deplete, the depletion of trying to fix everyone's mm -hmm. idea of you yes. that rinses away. And then your life is so much richer yes. and calmer. It's sweet ease. And I just want it for everyone. <laughs> but how do we, this how is do the we book explain that to, How do we explain that to kids that, like, you know, at some point you don't have, F, you're not going to have F's to give? And I mean, granted, you know, our, this next generation, they really are like, you know, they're I feel like they don't care already. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're way like, stronger than I felt like I was. Yes. They're just like, I've got time for yes. the drag. Yes. You know, I, I, I feel I, like they're fine on that. Yes. Or seeing them like pull out receipts or check adults. I'm just like, yes, yes, go forth, <laughs> go forth, niece. I'm like, I just um, <laughs> the whole time, I'm like, yes, come back. Yes. Yep. Like, <laughs> pop, pop off. <laughs> Like, I just want to support you at this point. Like, I just like, yep. you know, uh, I just, yes. Okay. I want to read one more. Okay. Um, and then I think we have a little bit more time before questions, but yes. Yes. Um, so this is also like closer to the beginning of the book. I was trying to avoid like stuff in the back, but um, a week later, a week later and Laylee still avoided me like the plague or a pop quiz or a dentist appointment or that person who just ate onions for lunch. She don't pick up my calls, and now I see her with Samantha, Octavia, Tasia, and Tiffany. So I start to spend every day after school at the basketball court doing drills. I think maybe today I'll run into Laylee at the pool. Maybe today she will show up. Maybe today she won't be mad at me anymore. Maybe today she treat, maybe today she treat me better than dirt. I only get sad when I round the corner and, and see 
and see only the mommy and me group is in the pool. I pull off my basketball shorts and tug the strap of my stu stupid swimsuit before I dive into the deep end. So why I love that one so much is it's that like you're, you're still holding out hope for the person who has basically been abusing you. And that is something that travels with us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, into our adult relationships, not only with, you know, our friends, but with our significant others. Like we have a, I think sometimes it's interesting how like there was no, or at least I was not handed a manual of how to date, like how to have a boyfriend, what should that looks like? I, I think I sort of just kind of like, I, and I made this joke like a while ago, I was said like, I literally learned like what love and stuff like look like from like music videos and like rap songs. <laughs> That's accurate actually. <laughs> like like DMX was like my like precipice of like the man I wanted. And I'm like, you know. Wow. You know that's what I mean? a, That's a very specific this vibe. Was, this was a very specific time in my life where I was like, yes, this is the type of man that I would like. These are my aspirations. And I'm just like, wow. and then even the guys that you date or I've dated, I think that like, you know, I give a lot of like second chances mm -hmm. um, because I'm holding out hope yes. because you want the best, you you never could believe that someone would want to hurt you like purposely. So it's always, I like, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to like write the manual for like young ladies, like this is how you date. And this is, you know, this is what communication is, what love, what, um, what is it called? Uh, not safe love, but you know, healthy love looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I don't really hear in songs today. <laughs> yes, it's not the same um, when you. I, I can't say that it, it it existed before, but I do. I, I I'm really attracted to those songs of like Motown, where like people are are working for your love. And I think that there is a part of the young people in this book that are like always trying to give a second chance in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. um, so the way Sky moves is definitely informed by cousin Inga, who you'll see say the same sort of things about big sister Issa, her big yeah. sister. Um, and I just wanted to keep showing these reflections all throughout our lives because they're there we rarely stream them together mm -hmm. because we feel like, oh, it's happening in a vacuum. But who we are attracted to be around, whether romantic or platonic, all of that has a root. And uh, that root is usually um, something that we've decided we deserve. Oh, yeah. Whether it's true or not, mm -hmm. that's the thing that we're holding on to. Like, obviously, people being mad at me for no reason is regular, right? So like, I must keep myself open for the moment that they come back, right? So like, whatever that thing is, I, I just wanna be able to like excavate mm -hmm. and clean that root, yes. let that wound heal so that everything uh, thereafter is is something that you want as much as the other person. Yeah. And that way we won't be like waiting until we're in our, our mid years being like, and now I'm not taking your stuff. I want you like healthy right now. <laughs> You deserve it right now, today. Yeah, right now, yes. I think, I mean, and, you know, I, honestly, the root of, um, or the emotional part of my book, Grown, really came from my own experience of being in an age and appropriate relationship. And mm -hmm. a lot of the manipulation, you know, definitely still kind of affects me today. I don't really, like, accept gifts that well because mm. I felt like gifts were used to, you know, sort of right. like well, do all these things. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I feel like, you mm. know, and even if it was unintentional manipulation, yeah. um, you know, it's still something that I absorbed and I kind of like, you know, I felt myself like, you know, tighten up or like, you know, like you said, I kind of, you know, felt like, oh, well, I must deserve this because mm -hmm. I didn't do this. So there was a lot of like that, that kind of, like we talked about, like, you know, it start it can start with friendships. It doesn't even have to be a boy. It literally could just be your friends or your family members. Yeah. So which is which is wild. But 
I do want to ask you before we go into questions too. Okay. I do want to ask you about like, so y'all, I've seen Mo for a while. It's amazing to see her in this space, in this Y space, because right. she's been on the stage. And mm -hmm. like I asked her, you know, a couple of days ago, whenever we spoke, I was kind of like, you know, is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. This one okay? second. Like, oh. <laughs> Got it? It's it's a hotel, so I don't know where because <laughs> I'm like like hello. <laughs> um shout out to Zoom everywhere and anywhere. Word, right? <laughs> yes. Te technology. I'm I'm saying. I'm um, sorry. To, uh, Oh, no, 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 it was cool. I was asking, like, how does it feel like, you know, is it hasn't been like a huge shift for you going from, you know, direct poetry stage, all of your accolades, everything that you do, and then now being in this YA world? Because, I, I mean, like I said, like, I came from the TV world, and which I felt like was a little similar, but then I like plopped in here and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I still continue to that to this day. Yeah. But I, I'm sitting in that clubhouse. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, it is it is so different in in a sense that it's an industry all of its own, and there are so many checkpoints, mm -hmm. right? That that you need to make sure that you're checking into mm -hmm. to assure that you're doing the right thing for your book, for your relationships with books, and for who you would like to be in the world of YA. Like, I don't want to be a fly by night person. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be here for a while. How do I assure that I am adding to the the legacy of YA mm -hmm. writers rather than just trying to profit off of um, tragedy for teens? Mm -hmm. So I find myself studying all of the writing that comes out, watching all of the teen films, um, and, and, and trying to like, not just be graceful. I don't think I, I mean, how do I articulate it? Cause it's, I don't want to say it's like a crew, but it is a whole new game of like, it's a whole new rules, all new game. Certain players remind me of poetry, the performance poetry world. Yes. But really the the like the choosers, the judges are the young people. Mm. You know what I mean? And I'm used to that, but I'm not used to going through all of these different methods to talk to young people. So it's been interesting trying to figure out, you know, who's the whiz? <laughs> I just want to like read these poems to these kids. <laughs> a whole panini came and happened and took away that opportunity to do these live readings that I'm used to doing. Yes. So now I had to figure out how my my book and my poetry self can be introduced to this YA world virtually. And, and will it be sustainable? Um, mm. I'm also like very much a, a fan of the um, heart work that um, some YA authors are doing. They they feel like they're really invested in the growth and care of young people. And mm -hmm. I miss that, I miss that kind of integrity. I can't say that that was always uh, uh, available on site in the performance mm -hmm. poetry world because yeah. it was between, you know, like bar and theater. Like you never know what you would get. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you kind of just like, you know, it's it's a, a beautiful confetti of woe. But with this, it feels like people are quite intentional. And um, and I, I just want to be surrounded with, with folks who don't compromise their integrity. So I, I'm willing to be a student. I'm willing to learn. But I do feel out of sorts. I do feel like, you know, yeah, the water is quite rough. Um, <laughs> but I'm still, you know, I got I got my little arm. What are those things? The banana? <laughs> Your floaties. My floaties. <laughs> I'm going to weigh the water, child. I'm going to sing Makita. I'm going <laughs> to sing them spirituals. I'm going to get us free. You watch. Yes. <laughs> I love that because I love that you're very intentional with your work. I mean, you know, you always have been, but this is very much like, it's not even a frustration. You're just kind of like, yeah, just move out the way because I want to talk to these kids. Like, mm -hmm, get out. 
And yes, because you're not like you don't you don't consider yourself a brand. This is fully who you are. And I think some people kind of like come into the game, you know, with a, a very direct like understanding of how they want to present themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't really know understand that so much. Um, I should like it seems like that's something I should understand the idea of branding, especially like you know working in television. Like everyone was uh, like rappers are a brand and stuff like that. And I feel like I came in with the intention of writing stories for my younger self, mm -hmm. knowing how many of those young Tiffany's are out there right now. Like mm -hmm. not even like, you know, we're not like a little subset. We are, we're like all over Brooklyn. Like, you know, we live, we live by like mad like schools over here. Yes. I miss I think I there's miss at least four. This. There's at least four right on the corner. Yes. I miss yeah. these kids. I kind of miss like hearing them like, you know, just like savagery towards each other. Like I miss hearing these snaps at, you know, yeah. I, I kind of I miss I, the dancing. Oh, the no yes, music the dancing. dancing. You know, I miss kids so bad. <laughs> yeah, the joy. I really yeah. miss the joy. Yeah. But I, I, I understand that I don't really know how people are in, introducing themselves to the white world. I feel quite conflicted because um, I, I do so much. Not like I'm like killing it. I'm just, my, my world is still poetry and I use it as the nucleus. And I love that poetry can go into all these different avenues. So I'm talking about mass incarceration and I'm doing work with, you know, the uh, folks that are just released from prison. I'm talking about, um, you know, what, what does it mean for a young black femme body to take up space through a YA novel? I'm doing a poem, um, I don't know, for for uh, some commercial. I'm doing audio books. I don't know what my brand is, sis. I don't think I have one. I'm just really trying to make sure that our stories yeah. and our Black selves are remembered. Because what I do know about the work is that if it is not archived, they will completely erase us. Ooh. And I shan't, okay? I mm. will not. Um, I've been told to shut up as far as I can remember, which is probably why I, I started writing in the books because they kept telling me to be quiet. Um, <laughs> and I just like kept it going because I know what it's like for someone to tell you to be quiet simply because of who you are yeah. and because of how young you are and because what gender you are. And what is it like this work is a testimony against that kind of erasure. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't need to like break out into like any sort of like you know choreography or nothing. Like I, I totally understood what you were saying here. Like, nah, this is uh, the choreo. Though. <laughs> like one day it's gonna happen. Um, it's great to like. I mean, honestly, it's super dope to like just be able to be myself with you. Like, and that's been like kind of like the joy. Really, it's like I, I let go of trying to. Um, be this different person and been able to be myself, not fully myself, because you know, there is some ratchet there that I have to like, you know, I've pulled back. Mo has actually pulled me back from some things on occasion. I did? Yes, you did. You stopped me from beating somebody up once. So it's fine. We're fine. Mm. Yeah. So, you know. I believe it because I believe in you. But also we shared that DMX locks and people <laughs> some concert together. And so I just feel like we can forever. I just gotta make sure we <laughs> That was y'all. That was like the most mosh up of like old school rappers. I mean, old school, just like, you know, just like a bunch of rappers that, you know, they would sing maybe like a minute of their own song and then just go off. And we were just like, who, who, who is that? Like? <laughs> like, what, what just happened? Like, was that a what? What's yeah. going on? I don't know. <laughs> yes. So, anyway, let me take some questions. Okay. Um, for these this was last. fun. Yes. Because like, I really do hope we get to do this in person. We have to. We have yeah. to. I think we should just make a road trip to Karis. Ooh, books. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. We we got we got that. Boom. Um, and we could just stay in Nick Stone's house. Yes. Ping. Boom. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> All right. First question: How do you how do both of you think of original captivating prose, especially for describing emotional states of characters? <sighs> yes, mermaid. How do you think of it? 
Um, because you try to deflect like it's just me. We. Yes, I, I really did. I was like, yes, poet. Yes, yes. Go. Girl. You wrote it. Um, I think I, I tend to hold like I tend to have one theme in my book, and I hold on to that. So, for instance, um, you know, Grown had a theme of swimming. How she felt like she was kind of like losing herself. She was drowning. She was going up against water. Like that was constantly how. You know, it does feel in real life when you are going up against something like what pushes back on you consistently? What is so unpredictable in this on this rock that we are floating on? What is the one thing that is like incredibly unpredictable? And I feel like the one thing is water. Mm. Um, and so that was a part of just like finding kind of like, you know, just a thread that I can like weave into the entire story that, you know, grounds um, Enchanted. Um, in her sort of quest to find herself and to fight again so much. So and I do that with a lot of my books. Um, I think this next book I have coming out, I think it's like a tone of fire, just feeling like you are, you know, kind of coughing on, you know, the own smoke from that's burning up within. Um, I, I like looked over at like my books, like, what do y'all see that? Like, <laughs> you have so many friends. Hey, let's go. Look at that library. Um, yeah. <laughs> in the Malcolm X book, we we um we talked about the idea of um kind of bringing Marcus Garvey into you know how he sort of his awakening mm -hmm. um, because they were originally Garveyites um, before he became Detroit Red, mm -hmm. and you know looping back to that and remembering sort of the roots of like you know your culture and that you weren't just like you know this Detroit where you weren't a hustler. You didn't like come from that. You came from, you know, you came from a respectable family that believed in education and culture. Your mother was West Indian. The moment I found that out, I was like, oh, no, nah, he wasn't. He wasn't doing all this nonsense. <laughs> like he was on the streets at a young age, like a young age in terms of teen. Yes. But like, nah. Um, so, yeah, that was my long winded answer. I've just kind of. <laughs> that. Um, I think what I've tried to do with Chlorine Sky uh, is really just center the voice in a way that did not feel inauthentic. And that was really the crux for me. Like how, how do I assure that things that feel like, oh, this is broken language or this is, you know, Ebonic. No, this is, this is a part of the English language. And this is how our young people speak. And, and it's a valid form of language too. Yeah. Um, so everything that I wrote, it, it, it is, there, there is some, some lilt um, in the slant rhyme. There is um, ways that you'll speak it, that you find yourself um, like bobbing, you know what I mean? Because uh, as a child of hip hop, there's always this soundtrack that's playing in my head. So the response, in the poetry, in the in the prose, um, in the voice, uh, is soundtracked by a, a movement um, or a moment that is feeding is feeding the energy of, of that of that particular uh, snapshot. So I don't I don't know if it's all new, but I do know that authenticity plays a large part. I found a lot of young people that were like, "Yo, this is how we talk," right? And I was. <laughs> I, I and you should know that it's valid. You know what I mean? That means if you are free to speak the way you speak with your friends, then you will feel free enough to make those stories with that same urgency. Mm, yes. That's one of the things that I like learned after, you know, my first book. And there was so much like kerfluffle about the fact that I was using um, A, A, B, E. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is, what is that? Like, those are a lot of owls. Like, what is that? And someone had to break it down to me. And I was mm -hmm. like, but this is just like the way kids talk. Why aren't we respecting the way? I mean, if we're writing for kids. We should be writing how they talk and their experiences. So, you know, I think we should write for the kids who they are versus who we want them to be. That's so, right. Yeah. Uh, second question is, can you both talk a bit about your querying and submission journey and any advice you have for POC authors currently querying? Mm. I say find you uh, a group of folks who are doing that work 
mentors are spectacular. They, they are holy. Um, I owe so much to Nick Stone and Jason Reynolds and Tiffany Jackson and Elizabeth Acevedo, like people who took my call and was just like, okay, let's, let's walk through your worries. Blessing, blessing. Uh, I, I had no idea how much I needed someone just to hold me, you know what I mean? Like hold me on like my elbow, like you good, come on, this step won't be that hard. Uh, and also I would say as, as many workshops as you can do, as many books as you can read. Yeah. Do it. I definitely. But I don't have as many books as Tiffany. Let's find out what Tiffany's saying. What are we supposed <laughs> to do, sis? Um, so I was, um, I was a slush pile find as they call, like I cold queried my agent. Um, yeah, I didn't know. I really didn't know other than like, you know, I, I knew Jason, um, and you know, I knew like, you know, other people like very like from afar, a I didn't really have like a hook into the white children's like, community. Hence why, like, I'm still learning things to this day. So I, um, I uh, wrote a list of a hundred agents and I started to, after I like developed my book as much as I humanly possibly could, I started to go through like 20 batches, like the first mm -hmm. 20 and the second, but I didn't actually get past the first 20. I actually got four offers based off of the first 20. Wow. Um, and uh, my agent is actually uh, an agent that I was like kind of stalking her website because I gave all these query tracking uh, tips. Mm -hmm. It's called the agent in Wonderland. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I will say that, you know, as someone who is a, a writer of color, I do believe, yes, in mentorship um, and also uh, sponsorship, which is somewhat different because, you know, a mentor will kind of like give you guidance, but a sponsor is going to give you that alley-oop. So I would definitely say like, you know, kind of make those connections in workshops and conferences. I know it's slightly difficult right now, giving the panini mm -hmm. we're in the middle of, but I feel like while we're in the middle of this panini, you should get your work ready. Because one mm -hmm. of the things I, 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 I tend to notice is that most people come up to me and say like, oh, I want to write a book, or I got this book, and they only have like 20 pages done. And I'm always like, don't come back to me until you're on the fourth draft of your full novel. Like, don't come back. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, there's nothing I can do with like ambition. I need, mm -hmm. I, you know, or wishful thinking. I need ambition. I need like hard work. So um, I would say yes. Make sure your your book is actually done. And yes, uh, they uh, they're snatching this up out here, right? Like just <laughs> every which way possible. Yes, I love that you said that about sponsorship too. I I I I would be remiss if I did not shout out Jacqueline Woodson, who hand walked me to my agent. She said, "What you want to do, Mo? You ready?" And I and this is me, the poet. That's like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, girl. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> maybe. And she's like, no, you need to be. And I was like, okay, I'm ready. She said, okay, you have a meeting. And I was like, what? So you're right. Those alley oops above and beyond. Mm -hmm. They mean the absolute world. But they also it also put me uh it made me feel like I was on the fire because I did I would never let Jacqueline Woodson down. Like, are you bugging? I yes. would never. Exactly. So everything I walked in with, I walked in with four projects. Like this is, I'm ready. <laughs> what are we doing? What's up? And that first meeting, I signed uh, a three book deal. Wow. Yeah. Off of that first meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yes. Yeah. I love that energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I was. I was. It was amazing. I was very lucky. But I love that. Yes. Sponsorship is different than mentorship. And be mindful of them. Take it. Take care of the people who yeah. take care of you. Yes, yes. Taking care. Um, okay. Next question is: You're both so dope. Thank you. Do Thanks. you have any words of wisdom or encouragement for me to get to give my college students who are uh, budding writers? Mm -hmm. you, said, you said something that I usually tell. Um, anybody who's an inspiring writer is to read, read voraciously. Like yeah. I, like, I thought they were joking when they said like, Oh, reading makes you a better writer. But until I actually like, you know, found myself in the midst of like slight, like 
writer's block this past year. And I had to just sit down and just start reading. I'm like, let me just reread some of my old favorites, classics and all this kind of stuff. Like, yeah, I went back to Zora and, you know, I sort of just like absorbed some of her energy. Like you, you really do learn as you go along. So yes, read as much as possible. Yeah. And, and read all of the things. Sometimes we can't really read or hear things a certain way. So put on an audiobook. I do an hour audiobook a day and then two hours of reading and then two hours of writing. And that is my actual practice now because I have so many things due. Before I only wrote for an hour, I would listen to a, an audiobook and I would read one YA book a day. That was mm -hmm. what I was doing for the last year. Um, but like you, you just got to keep, yeah, you got to keep that muscle, you know, agile. Um, yeah. And also I would say, uh, do it anyway. The yeah. Young people, do it do it yeah, scared. there's there's so much fear of like uh, resistance or mm -hmm. or being told no, and you have to you got you walk you got to walk through the fear, you know, you have to walk through the fear. You got to walk up to it, look it in its eyes, and let it know that you're coming for it, because what you want is far more important than the fear. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Walk up to that fear. <laughs> Walk up to it. Look it in his face. No, we got time for one more. Do we have any more? Yes, uh, one here. Uh, this is actually from Zoraida. Says, is there any genre you like to write that you haven't or scared to write in? Which I'm also going to uh, piggyback that question and say, what is up next for you? That's okay. That's always my favorite question. Okay, so um, my second book, so Chlorine Sky is my first YA novel in verse. My second YA novel, um, which is coming out in January, is Vinyl Moon. And it's in prose. It's a hybrid, actually. So it's prose, poetry, and text messages. So it, it has a little bit of everything. But the one that I just got signed that I'm working on is a fantasy sci-fi vignette series. Oh, it's like Afrofuturist meets uh, yes meets pandemic meets teen surviving New York City. Oh, yes, yeah, um, yeah. You kind of like I think you sort of stole my answer a bit there because that's the one um, genre I am a little uh, afraid of is uh, fantasy. Mm -hmm. in any form because you know i'm very much like a realist like what is happening today even mm -hmm. though like um you know my next two books are sort of in the um horror space um uh, that still feels more realistic to me than like flying <laughs> space and battling aliens i don't know why like a right. ghost or you know whatever like a ghost like a haunted house i'm like yeah yeah that, that sounds right but you mm -hmm. want to go like fight spaceships i don't know i don't know so um <laughs> So sometimes I feel like I, and like we, we were talking about earlier is like reading as much as possible. I do try to like add a fantasy book uh, to like my rotation because I recognize the fact that I don't know it as well as, you know, others. And mm -hmm. I would, I would like to, you know, I would like to try um, my hand in it. So maybe one day I am scared of it though. Cause I don't, you know, fantasy, fantasy readers are, you know, they're, they don't play. They're thugs. I don't know. Yeah. I love it though. I love thug sickles. It's delicious. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming too. I'm gonna do some stuff too. Oh <laughs> but Ida said she would help. Yeah. Listen, as Thank much as I'm right afraid of it, I recognize that we we're not promised anything. We're not promised another book deal. We're not promised your eyes and ears. Mm -hmm. So if I can write the poem, if I can write the play, if I can write the podcast, if I can write the TV series, if I can write the fantasy, um, the four book series, the YA novel, the YA novel in verse, all of which I am doing or have done, then I must. That's it. I want I want it. I want that. I want those words spread everywhere. There is no there is no crack un, untouched. That's just, that's it. I just decided. I'm, it's like all black everything. I just want yeah. our work everywhere. I just I want it. Like the, the way we look at Zora Neale Hurston, it's like, whoa, she was an anthropologist. Oh, she had plays. Oh, she had poem. What? She had. Like, what? Like, whoa, whoa. Like, yes. Because yep. they weren't afraid. They were not. 
and maybe they were, but not enough to not tell their truth, not right. enough to give a hand at it. And I think that that's what made them mo the most amazing writers, mm -hmm. uh, the James Baldwin and the Audre Lorde and the uh, Pat Parker and Alice Walker and Sister Sonia Sanchez. They were not they were not willing to be anything less than a juggernaut. Yes. Yeah. They weren't afraid. That's the bottom line. Like they, you know, they ain't never scared. That I just totally slipped in a whole rat. Yeah, we should end. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't never scared. They everywhere. You ain't scared. never there. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> this makes sense because this is an Atlanta bookstore. So boom. Yeah. Um, I think uh yeah, I thank you so much for thank you. Um, inviting me here. Um, I'm so like, I'm so proud of you. This is a beautiful story. I'm really just like thrilled. So hopefully soon we'll be out on the road uh, together so we can kiki and maybe uh, work on that fantasy. Yes, we will turn up. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Tiffany. No, thank you. Yes, thank you to you both. Uh, I'm really hoping that you uh, can come through on this road trip and stay at Nick Stone's house because we would love it. Uh, I dropped the pre-order links for White Smoke, which is Tiffany's forthcoming book that's the horror book which we're really excited about as well as i remember death by its proximity to what i love which is um mahogany's um uh, book that's coming out that's about um incarcerated women in girl or the impact of incarceration on women and girls so um th those yes those are coming out later this year but you can pre-order them now from karis if you've not bought um chlorine sky yet uh, click this teal button at the bottom of your screen. I suspect many of you are here because you've already read it, but if you haven't read it yet or you want to buy a copy for a friend, um, maybe even a friend you've already like gone through some trouble with and reconciled with. This is, <laughs> this is so this smart. Is, you know, we can have a bestie book group. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yes, I mean, this, I, this I love is being, all therapy right here. <laughs> it's so it's so key, though. And, you know, I really appreciate in both of y'all's work, how you really honor young people's realities and their friendships, because friendship is the love of your life when you're that age. And so often we just kind of shunt that to the side as you get older and get into romantic relationships. But so much of our work um, as feminists is to remember, like, your romantic life and your your best friends, like, they they all matter um yeah. and we don't just want to prioritize one for the other so um i really love that that this book in particular honors that so um i want to let folks know that i'll be adding captions to this and putting it up on youtube so be sure to tweet that link out um if you if you see that and um otherwise i think thanks so much to both of you for being with us on the sunday evening i hope you stay safe and well <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Eat something good. Make sure you have your greens. Have That's a good right. night. Stay safe. Good night, y'all. Bye.